It is my honor to introduce the 2008 Spirit of Justice awardee, GLAD's founder, Attorney John Ward. And let me, and let me begin by taking us back again to the mid to late 1970s and where we stood legally as a community. Sexual intimacy for gay men and lesbian people was still commonly criminal. It was so here in Massachusetts. There was virtually no protection against discrimination. Regardless of years together, gay and lesbian couples were always treated as total legal strangers. If we had children, they could be taken away for no reason other than our sexual orientation. And non-biological parents had no legal relationship to their children. Okay, and now take a look at John Ward. He found his way here to Boston in those, in those 1970s and decided to go to law school where he found a home. He graduated from Boston University Law School in 1976 and then he clerked for Judge Raymond Patina of the Federal District Court in Rhode Island for a year. And so in 1977, John returned to Boston and having talked to a gay lawyer in California about this whole idea, decided to hang out his shingle and advertise in the gay community news the first openly gay male attorney in town. Yeah. The stage was set and Boston in 1977-78 was an interesting time to say the least. Anita Bryant had made a big splash in Florida fighting to repeal the Dade County Anti-Discrimination Ordinance. Word spread to Boston and our 80-year-old district attorney named Garrett Byrne saw an idea for the focus of his 1978 re-election campaign and lo and behold in December of 1977 the DA broke the news of a sex ring in nearby Revere, Massachusetts indicting 24 people on over 100 felony counts involving older men and allegedly having sex with younger men. The DA called it the tip of the iceberg, and he set up a hotline asking the public for anonymous tips on homosexuals. Then, in March of 1978, 103 men were arrested in the Boston Public Library and charged with open and gross lewdness. In this climate of hysteria and bold attacks, the community began to mobilize to defend the men arrested to stop the hotline, to stop harassment, and to reform the sex laws. And John was counsel to the Defense Committee. <laughs> to, to give you just a little flavor of that time, as John was preparing to go to court to get an injunction against that district attorney hotline, he got a call from the DA's first assistant the night before. The conversation ended with John saying, well, I guess I'll see you in court and the first assistant saying, okay, honey. Th this was the gay community fighting back and it wasn't pretty and it wasn't easy. As John said, I wasn't in fear of my life, but I was scared. Well, John and our side really won most of the battles that year. For example, none of the men arrested at the library ended up with a conviction. And John saw an opportunity he saw that the response to the library arrests became an organizing tool. He realized he didn't need to work at this alone. There were people ready to fight. And he knew there was this IRS thing called a 501c3 nonprofit tax exempt organization that could exist. And he got his boyfriend to type up the application and he got a bunch of radicals mostly to sign on as the first board of directors. And GLAD came to be. And, and for the next several years, GLAD was, in large measure, John. He was its volunteer executive director, its landlord, its litigator, its chief funder and fundraiser, and its cheerleader, always looking for volunteer support to increase the fledgling GLAD's reach. And GLAD, and this is John and a few friends did some interesting things in those first years. Just a few examples. They argued to the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court that sexual orientation discrimination was actually discrimination based on sex. 
The court rejected the argument, but they noted their recognition that sexual orientation was a sex-linked characteristic. Brought a successful suit for a Rhode Island high school senior who wanted to attend his senior prom with a male date. Brought suit against that Boston Public Library and police officials regarding the sting operation at the library. Represented a transgender woman who had lost her job. Argued as an amicus to the Supreme Judicial Court in a major victory, holding that homosexuality per se does not make a parent unfit. Filed and won with the ACLU and another courageous attorney, Catherine Triantafilu, a case involving the mayor's effort to change the gay pride route only 36 hours before the march worked to expunge homosexual activity references in military discharge papers, fought for a lesbian mother whose custody order required her to live apart from her lover, defended a man arrested and charged with disorderly conduct for doing nothing more than posting publicity for a gay pride rally. And I could go on and on. Well, then in 1983, John left Boston for California, and he sent his baby out into the world on its own. But he did return for a couple of command performances. In 1995, John became the first openly gay man to argue at the United States Supreme Court in Glad's case involving the Boston St. Patrick's Day Parade. And then in 1997, John and Mary Bonato successfully challenged the application of the mass sex offender registry law to a man who had been entrapped by state police in a rest area. In a spectacular victory, the court established that low-level offenders have a liberty interest entitling them to a hearing as to whether they can even be required to register. Perhaps a story can bring this full circle. In 1979, a lesbian couple from the North Shore came to see John and said they wanted to get married. And John said, well, you can't. You can't get married. But there are some things we can do with contracts and wills and powers of attorney. And he went to, he went to court with them so they could change their names to a hyphenated last name. Well, 25 years later in 2004, with the Goodrich decision in effect and same-sex couples marrying, John was at a glad party and these two women, now married, came up to him and said, you know all that stuff you did with those papers and everything? That was really important for us because we've been together for 25 years now and sometimes it's been difficult. But when things were difficult between us, we'd look at those papers and say, well, you know, we signed this contract. We have to stick with each other. So what a change in the world from 1978 to 2008. As an old movement radical, now, John, I know has done some head scratching about where we've come in those 30 years, wondering about gay liberation and gay assimilation. He recently said this in an interview, quote, sometimes I walk down the street in San Francisco and I think, is this what I gave my life for? <laughs> A little bit of drama and self-pity combined, but you know, I think basically deep down, I kind of trust human nature and the way that, as its best, it moves. And so far, we've softened people's attitudes about gender and sexuality in a good way. Because everybody suffers the burden of identity, you know. And if you can loosen the strings a little bit, I think it makes everybody a little bit easier in their life, a little less afraid of being who they are. And I think that's really good. That's the John I have known and loved since I met him at GLAD 29 years ago. That's the mindset that brought GLAD into being, a sense that people were suffering and something had to be done about it. It brings to mind an old chestnut, not John, but a quotation. And I am sure you all know Margaret Mead's words. Quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. From our vantage point in 2008 in Boston, the hub of the universe after all, look at what John has done. Look at what GLAD has done. Look at what you have done and think of all we can and must still do. It is my great joy to present the 2008 GLAD Spirit of Justice Award to the man who made all this possible, John Ward. <laughs>